Welcome to this class. Today I'll be focusing more on procurement policy, laws and regulations in Kenya. And I'll be presenting uh, Daniel Ndigwa. So when we talk about procurement, it has evolved over the years from a mere and developed uh, process to a more sophisticated process. So public procurement system has grown from various stages during the pre-colonial pre era, post-colonial era, and up to date. The stages of evolution in Kenya have been divided in the following stages. The first one was the colonial era, and this happened uh, between 1953 and 1963. Then we have the post-colonial era, which happened between 1963 and 1978. The period of 1978 and 2001, and the era of reforms, which was between 2001 and 2010, and the current era of the new constitution and the era of the procurement and asset disposal of 20, 2015. So what we need to understand, during that time, the Central Tender Board was uh, the main body that was doing all the public procurement. It was established under the National Treasury Circular in 1955. And the main focus was to ensure that they did all those activities that were to be done at that level of procuring goods, works and services. During that time also, we also had the Crown, Crown agents who their main focus was to ensure that they did all the procurements for international exports. The chief speaker of the store was appointed by the chairman while the chief purchasing was the secretary. However, in 1959, the supply and transport department was established under the Ministry of Public Works. And the main focus was to deal with supply and purchasing services. In the 60s, the treasury issued the Ministry of Works, Stores and Services funds for the regulation. During that time also, the establishment of regulation established a supply branch as a division that dealt with the procurement of common goods item. We also have had the government ministry, departments and agencies, which were also supposed to be done by the supply branch. The government supply manual was also established in the 1978 with a focus of ensuring that public procurement was done in a more organized way. The supply manual was uh, created, the supply manual position was created, and the director of government supply was responsible for ensuring provision and adherence to the manual. Then in 1974, through the Treasury Circular, it was changed, and some of the functions were transferred from the Central Center Board. Uh, from the ministry to the Ministry of uh, Works. So the Central Tender Board was established and the main focus was to ensure at the end of the day, there were the people who are going to do most of the procurement. The Central Tender Board also was composed of the Deputy Secretary from different ministries. We also had a Chief Executive Officer who was the Secretary and acted as a Secretary to the management of the supply offices. So that process was there until uh, uh, 2012 and uh, yeah. different, uh, different uh, organizations. Basically the procurement of government was divided into three where we had the central tender committee, which sorry for the inconvenience. So procurement was divided in various committees where we had the central tender committee, which was responsible for procuring goods worth 20 million and above. We also had the ministerial tender committee. And lastly, we had the district tender committee was, uh, which was doing small tenders. So according to a research done by the chain, he elaborated on various issues. For example, the central tender board was, was abolished and procuring entities were now responsible of their own procurement. During that time also the chairperson was 
on the private sector. And the secretary was basically from the finance docket. So the coming into effect of the exchequer was introduced in 201. And the main focus was focused more on how well to control the various contracts in government. Because during that time, most of the contracts were uncontrolled and this was bringing variations in the contract. There was also issue of overpricing where different organizations were overpricing their products and this affected the government operation. <clears throat> There was also a lack of uh, structured authorization of expenditure where <coughs> various organizations or various public entities were not doing a structured expenditure and this affected the whole operation. There was also lack of transparency and competition and other factors that affected how the government was doing various responsibility. In 205 also they introduced the Public Procurement Disposal Act with a focus of ensuring that procurement was done in a more organized way. So the Public Procurement and Disposal Act was established in 205 and in 209 we also had the public-private partnership. And the main focus was to ensure economic stimulation and promoting investment of local industry and creation of value for, for money. During that time also we had quicker deliveries of projects and improved incentives to market forces. And as a result, it led to cost effectiveness. So in 2011, they introduced the preservation and reservation docket where their main focus was to ensure they promoted local industry. And they also enabled economic development of small and medium enterprises with the focus of microfinances also. And the other focus was on the disadvantaged groups like the women and the people living with disability and the youths. They also enabled the citizen uh, contractors where many local industries were given a chance to ensure that they performed or they bidded for particular tenders. They also did what is called subcontracting with the foreign suppliers. Basically, they could give the foreign suppliers a chance to bid for a particular tender. But at the same time, they also gave a chance to local subcontractors to be part of the bigger picture. They also introduced the tender portal of uh, public procurement oversight authority with a focus of coming up with a database that ensured storage of information about various suppliers and also gave a chance on advertisement and contract award for contracts that were worth 5 million and above. They also introduced the IFMIS, which was an integrated financial management system and the focus was to improve the government operation when it came to issues of financial reporting and data. They also implemented the e-procurement system that aimed at improving how the government was going to perform various issues. The procurement cycle is very common in procurement. And when you talk about the, the cycle, what we mean is a series of steps that need to be followed in order to successfully purchase goods, works or services in an organization. And different uh, organizations must be able to follow this process when they are acquiring goods, works or services. The other important aspect is that at all stages of the procurement cycle, there must be some aspects of recording all the items and filing them as the process progresses. So the stages include the following, number one, preparation of the procurement plan. So the procurement plan is prepared by the procurement department in consultation with the end user or the user department. The other important process is preparation of specification. And when you talk about specification, these are descriptions that are needed to be purchased in a particular item or some of the characteristics that are needed in a particular pro pro uh, product or service. These uh, specification must be very clear and concise 
so that every bidder is able to understand clearly what the scope entails. The other important uh, stage is the preparation of the bidding document. The tender document must be prepared and this document is prepared with the prescribed standard set by the organization or the procuring entity. These documents are prepared by the accounting officer in consultation with the user department. And the accounting officer is always the CEO of a particular procuring entity or public entity. They must contain sufficient information that are easily read out and understood by all the, the parties. And the main focus is to enhance uh, uniformity in the bidding process and predictability. It also enhances the efficiency of the bidding process and at the end of the day, reduces the cost in the organization. In case of unresponsive bids, it also helps to increase competition and prepare the reviews on time. The other thing that is very critical during that time is pre-qualification. And when we talk about pre-qualification, basically is a procedure that allows different candidates who are qualified to be chosen. And when you are preparing a pre-qualification document, the, the following items must be present. You have the name and address, the contact, the outline or nature or the quantity of procurement requirements, the criteria for pre-qualifying -qual, pre suppliers, the instructions, instructions on the location, the deadline, and at the end of the day, the declaration or preference or reservations, if any. Then after that, you advertise the bids. And when you're advertising the bids, you normally advertise them in a government tender portal, or you can decide to use the procuring entity website. It also requires you to at least uh, advertise on a newspaper that is circulation, its circulation is worldwide. Uh, when you're dealing with national tender, you also need to ensure that you advertise those national tenders on the government portal, uh, procuring entity websites, and at least two uh, countrywide circulated daily newspapers, same as the international tender. But in the international tender, you normally consider international media very, very critical. And you can also decide to advertise on the embassies. Then the other important steps is receiving and opening of bid. So receiving and opening of bid is very, very critical. When you're opening the bids, you, it's normally advisable that you invite various uh, bidders to come to be part of the bidding process. And these envelopes uh, must be sealed. And when they are opened, they must be announced in public so that people know. And at least two officers must be able to sign the tender opening documents so that uh, it acts as an evidence that indeed it was opened. The other important aspect is evaluation of bids. During evaluation, there are three stages that are very critical. We have the preliminary stage of evaluation, we have the very technical stage, and we have the financial stage. But during evaluation, an, a committee is normally, is normally chosen by the procuring, uh, the accounting officer who formulates an ad hoc evaluation committee. They normally prepare an evaluation report which is submitted to the head of the procuring entity who must come up with what is called a professional opinion. The other thing is contract award and notification, which is very, very key. After the final decision has been made, the accounting officer takes into account the professional opinion, which is very, very key. And this professional opinion is normally given by the head of the procuring, the head of the procurement function. The main objective is to give the highest bidder who has scored highly. The successful bidder is awarded the contract once the final decision has been made. The other important stage is negotiation. Negotiation is very, very critical. When you are negotiating, basically you are setting terms on the discounts after sales service or training, if there's any. 
and the award of the successful bidder should be published in all so that everybody is able to see. Then signing of the procurement contract, signing must be done by both parties, the buying party and the, the supplier. And successful bidders must first sign, then the procuring entity signs later. Then the, the other important stage is the contract administration. Basically, when you're talking about contract administration, you are monitoring the whole process and seeing if it was really implemented and it was in line with your various terms of operation or contract. Receiving an inspection is the next stage. Once the final uh, signing has been done, the next stage is to give the supplier an order and the supplier will be able to bring the items on board so that you can receive and inspect them. And the body, the committee is normally referred to as the inspection and acceptance committee, which is, does all the inspection on behalf of the organization. Then we also do what is called inventory management and storage of goods. So inventory management allows you to be able to manage and prevent losses and wastages in inventory. And when you talk about inventory, this is the stock that is kept in a particular organization. So you must ensure at all cost inventory is taken care of to avoid issues of losses in the organization. Thank you for listening. Next time we shall start on managing the procurement process. Thank you.